advice would you give to uh, companies wanting to build a culture of innovation and uh, create a more innovative team? Yeah, so this is fantastic because um, you're already touching something on my heart. I was actually an English teacher prior to getting into technology and then prior to getting into this kind of a role. And what I've noticed is that in school, children start communicating amongst themselves at the desk, right? And teachers traditionally would be like, don't do that, right? Be quiet. But in actual fact, that's the learning, right? It changes neuroplasticity, right? To have engagement. And so we've been trying to replicate this kind of thing through applications. I mean, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of these things are applications to try to build some kind of cohesiveness and dialogue amongst people. And they are uber successful, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of these kinds of programs. So what corporations need to do is just follow that kind of format. People need the opportunity to contribute more than they do to receive information. When that happens, and so when there is a culture of open contribution, let's just see what sticks to the wall, right? Let's just throw a bunch of ideas out there, and then let's have some kind of program by which people can throw their contribution up publicly, and you can rate it, right? You can say, hey, this is good, this is bad, right? People actually prefer a public pat on the back than they do anything else in a corporation. So this is what we have to foster amongst our teams. You communicate with international leaders uh, in cybersecurity globally. So what is the secret to clear and effective communication? Yeah, so right now I'm working on here, I'll show you a couple of things. Um, I'm working on a dialogue uh, with folks. This is geopolitical cyber warfare, hacktivism as a trend, right? So this is a very big deal and it's a kind of a complicated um, issue for corporations. Right, so communicating the most complicated issue needs to be done in a fashion by which, again, people can engage in a tussle. So it's, it's sort of like this. You almost want to have a fight in your organizations, right? This kind of subject matter here, um, others that are very, very engaging and therefore complicated, you want to allow people to say, okay, you know what? I want to own a little piece of this communication, a little piece of this. And you go, oh, okay, that's interesting. So if you own it, you're responsible for it. And then if you can divide the, the difficulty of that complex issue, communicating it amongst several owners within your organization, within the team, right, that is wrestling this issue to the ground, now all of a sudden you've got responsibility. When you've got responsibility, people solve their own problems. And so the issue, I think, in the top-down leadership model that just seems to be so prevalent in corporations today is that I will own everything and I will assign tasks to people. And what do you want to do as soon as you've been given a chore? You want to get it over and done with. You want to check the box. You want to say, yes, I've done my homework, right? Well, it's very different if people own a piece of the puzzle, right? They own the challenge themselves. And if you can just give them that, if you can figure out a way to make people own it, they are going to run with it. And they'll figure out the communication issues for themselves. It's magic at that point, or what I like to call automagical. What are some of the top threats that organizations face through their people? Well, I mean, this is what, unfortunately, I have to bring up again, the coronavirus, because it was the largest exodus from corporate sites in human history. It's the largest shift in wealth in, in human history as well. Um, you know, this, is, this has been completely unprecedented. And so if I can use an analogy, throughout the last 25 years of the internet's history and cybersecurity, therefore, what we've done is we've built this amazing castle, castle walls, we dug a moat, right? We filled it with alligators and water, and we put a drawbridge in. The drawbridge is your firewall, right? And we said, nothing else is coming in and out of this castle unless it goes over this drawbridge. And that's your firewall and intrusion prevention and data leak prevention. And we created little doors and windows, right? Okay. Then the cloud came along, cloud computing, which is to say somebody else's computer, right? Cloud is kind of an interesting name. It, we just think it goes into the cloud. It's sitting on somebody else's computer somewhere. But the cloud came along above the castle walls and started dropping information and sucking information out. Well, this was data leakage, which the industries weren't ready for. Then coronavirus came into the castle walls. So we sent all the villagers back out to the village. And we said, hey, go do your work from the village. 
So now the threat actors can see the whole village and all the people in the village, and there's no castle wall protecting them. This is the problem that got created in less than six months, first time in human history. It's a pretty wild idea. So what you have to do is you have to wrap a blanket of security through technology and education around uh, what we call users, employees, around the people now. And so we're starting to see already, the future is brilliant on this, what blockchain and artificial intelligence will do. You, Sophie, will carry all your personal information with you on a blockchain. This is where we're going in the future. So you won't need a credit card, right? You won't need a health insurance number, a social insurance number, right? You won't need to dig up all your health records from, in my case, 30 years, 40 years ago, to give to your current doctor because all that stuff comes with me securely in a blockchain. So that as soon as I go into the office, I can scan a device and they get all the information that I would allow to give them. Maybe it's a credit card, maybe it's my medical information. So that's the future. Today, what we can do though, is we can make sure that every employee is identified within our system and the applications, the access that they get, what's called remote access control, is unique to each and every person. And you need massive granularity on a system in which you can see where that user's going, what they're doing, and what things they're trying to touch and not trying to touch. I'll give you an example of behavioral analytics. So we caught a guy fairly recently who's working at an aviation company. I can't tell you who it is because there's litigation still pending with this uh, lawsuit. And so what this guy was doing is he was embedding turbine engine proprietary technology, so the data, into watchable YouTube videos. That was his actual job. He was working for this company, stealing information and embedding it into YouTube videos. It's called stenography. Now, these YouTube videos were how-to videos on other products that this company manufactures, gas turbines in this case, big gas turbines. And they were legitimate how-to videos, how to use their turbines, brake fix, these kinds of things. It's a customer service. Now, what our behavioral analytics engine did is it creates a trend and a baseline for a person's behavior. So as an example, and I'll make up the numbers, I don't know exactly what they are. My forensics team is dealing with this still today. Let's say he produces eight YouTube videos a week. So what the system does is it creates a baseline. This particular individual creates roughly eight videos a week. All of a sudden he's producing 20 because thieves are greedy, right? This is what tripped him up right? He was creating 20 every week or whatever the number was. And so all of a sudden, the behavioral analytics engine goes, hey, human eyes, let's put some human eyes on this thing. That looks weird. We don't know. He's making 20. Maybe he's just very busy getting ready for a vacation. We don't know. But let's put some human eyes on that. And after a human forensics, they found out that he was actually stealing this information. So that's what you've got to do now that all of your people, your employees are scattered out into the village is protect them from threat actors and protect your organization from insider threat. Could you tell me um, a few small changes businesses can implement today to protect themselves? I'm all over training, right? This is what we need, right? So if you think about the history of the internet, in 1983, DARPA, which is the US military's research and development branch, created this thing called TCP over IP. So we'll be technical for a moment. And then uh, CERN in Switzerland created the World Wide Web from that in I think about 1990, somewhere around there, 92, something like that. Since then, we have all of a sudden created the opportunity for almost every human and certainly billions of us for the first time in history to put an encyclopedia in everyone's pocket. Now, that's over a 25 year history. Look what the great Renaissance did for humanity. In 1440, Johann Gutenberg invented this thing called the printing press, right? Just pieces of wood with letters. And for the first time in human history, the mass distribution of knowledge was possible. 200 years later, you had the great Renaissance, you get Spinoza, right? You get Shakespeare, you get Newton, you get Galileo, 
right? You get all of these incredible minds because the democratization of knowledge was available to humanity. Now, this was a pocket, of course, in Europe mostly, and it created the Western world and gave birth to everything we have today. The thing that I'm talking to you through, electricity, right, and ones and zeros, the internet, is all because of that great renaissance. The internet is the second, what I call the second great renaissance. And we haven't even seen what will happen yet. There are math magicians in countries like India and Africa that would have, we would have never heard of because they weren't in part of that first renaissance, right? Those printed books didn't get that far. But the internet is with everyone today. And so what you're going to see is you're going to see a massive, massive adoption of technologies that people are just, for the general public, not fast enough to understand. So I've got an 80-year-old mother, right? <laughs> and she calls me all the time. What am I going to do from the United States, mom? I'm so <laughs> sorry. You can't even get on Zoom. I can't see your screen. This, I mean, I just, I'm, I feel so helpless for my poor mother. She needs education. Well, it's not just the 80 year old mothers that need education. I work in this space and every six months, and this is what I say to people who, who have no experience in cybersecurity, just come join the party. Within six months, you'll know pretty much as much as everyone else because it's changing so fast. Mm -hmm. So education is probably the largest challenge and I've got a solution for it. You see, the way we teach adults in a workplace environment is absolutely incorrect. The learning management system industry, right? LMS, learning management systems, where you have to take all that mandatory training that people do a big internal eye roll about, right? When you have to take that is a $360 billion a year industry. The average enterprise spends 19 million a year on training and education through their LMS. Ask anybody at a company if their LMS is any good and they enjoy their training. They all say no. I'll give you my own personal experience. GDPR, my European friends, even though I'm European, clearly, right? But from the US, we, have, we are mandated, every director and above and various different companies, certainly the one I'm in, is mandated to take GDPR training. So how do I take something that's been forced down my throat and mandated to me? This is how I do it, right? And I even look at the screen, click, 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 click. I'm half smart, so I'll challenge the multiple guess exam. I passed 100%. This is a true story. I've got 100% compliance with my GDPR training. So if you ask me anything about GDPR, I know nothing. I don't know anything about GDPR, but I'm 100% compliant. This is the problem we must solve for. This is the problem that information security officers must solve for, but also anybody in any department. Because if we're trying to educate our employees so that they can become more robust, they can be stronger and fortified, and yet they take training like I do, which people do, let's just be honest, right? Let's have a moment of honesty. Our bosses aren't watching, <laughs> right? This is, this is compliance. This is not, you're not changing me. You're not making me stronger, right? You're not giving the company advantage on knowing GDPR. We are no better off, and yet we've spent money doing this. We've, we've engaged employee time. So what's the solution? It's a long-winded answer. I hope this one makes the real, because the solution is great. It's called chunking. We've actually known this since 1956. In the most cited paper in psychological literature since the 1950s, Dr. Miller, a Harvard and Princeton uh, professor and graduate, created something that's called Miller's Law. Everybody knows it. The average human being can remember five to nine things for 20 minutes and then forgets them. Right? That's Miller's Law. The average human being remembers it's called seven plus and minus two right, for 20 minutes and then forgets them. Now, remember back to your, you know, high school and university days, mm -hmm. you crammed for an exam the night before, you blew through it, you got your 80%, 90%. Can you, do you remember anything from that? Yeah. No, of course you yeah. don't, <laughs> right? Because your neuroplasticity hadn't changed. Mm -hmm. So what you actually need and what Dr. Miller stumbled upon, but it takes decades for this information to get into the real world. We're still making the same mistake. We're not doing what he suggested. We have to chunk training on a daily basis. So essential training, like cybersecurity training, you have to give people a flash of it every single day, right? A bite, 
right? A B-Y-T-E, a bite of training, right? In cybersecurity every single day because repetition changes neuroplasticity and then you get behavioral change, mm -hmm. right? You cannot get behavioral change unless you have a biological neuroplastic change. And I've created programs and uh, lectures and min, mini vignettes, they're called small videos, so that people can be touched every single day with a little piece of training. Mm. 